are here for the next panel, which uh, will discuss enforcement and not enforcement, which Professor Tribe, of course, alluded to some in his uh, talk, so a nice introduction to this topic. And uh, we have Zach Price uh, from UC Hastings, Michael Dorf from Cornell, and our host organizer, Mark Tushnet from Harvard, to give us their views on an issue that <coughs> has arisen, as Professor Tribe pointed out, in multiple contexts in this administration, the question of the president not enforcing a law uh, against, that regulates private behavior, that regulates private individuals. And you can imagine a lot of hypotheticals beyond this with future presidents. The president comes in and says, I am no longer going to have my attorney general enforce federal gun laws because I think the states can take care of it. Questions like that we can all imagine. A complicated topic under Article 2, and we have experts to guide us through it. So uh, we're going to start off with uh, Zach. Thanks a lot, uh, Judge Kavanaugh. And um, let me just thank Mark for organizing the conference and including me. I've enjoyed it very much, and it's an honor for me to participate. So we're addressing, uh, as you know, enforcement and non-enforcement and the particular issues today related to marijuana and immigration. Um, but as Judge Kavanaugh suggested, I think it is important to keep an eye on the broader picture. And I think I try to approach both these two policies as examples of a recurrent type of separation of powers conflict. The central question that, that the two policies present is how far presidents or administrative agencies can go in declining to enforce laws that they find objectionable on policy grounds. In particular, how far can they go in assuring large subsets of regulated parties that the law won't be enforced against them? And I think it is crucial to appreciate that the issue can arise and historically has arisen across a range of contexts with generally with quite different political alignments from what these two issues present. So just to be concrete about it, I, mean, I personally find the administration's policy goals in these two examples quite compelling but I think one has to approach the legal and normative issues from a trans-substantive point of view. <coughs> what I want to do is, is briefly say something about how I think this relates to some of the broader themes of the conference with respect to contentious politics, and then just briefly run through some of the legal issues and the way I think about them. So I, I think there are, in terms of the themes of the conference, I think there are some structural reasons why we're seeing policies like this in this administration, but also in a sort of crescendo some degree over recent administrations. And one important aspect of that is the problem of gridlock that's been described. I think presidents, particularly President Obama, are setting enforcement policies against a background of partisan division and legislative incapacity, and that creates political pressure on presidents in a lot of ways to, to act independently on their own, to take broad views of their independent authority. I think another feature of the current environment that's important is that Presidents are also operating in an environment that, as Judge Barron and Todd Rakoff put it, is, is thick with law. Uh, the modern context, we've got a lot of statutes accrued over time, um, and a lot of them are, are quite harsh, designed to give the government leverage to achieve policy goals with limited enforcement resources. So that context is important because it makes this fundamentally negative choice about abstaining from enforcement or giving effect to particular laws potentially quite um, significant in a, in a range of areas. So, in other words, if, if, if you have a lot of law, you have political contestation over the merits of existing laws, and you've got congressional gridlock, stymieing legislative reform, then the executive power to cancel enforcement becomes potentially quite politically attractive, but also potentially quite significant as a type of policy choice. So, Another way of putting this, there may be a heightened risk of the executive branch exercising this power in ways that fit its understanding of what the law should be, rather than being faithful to what it, what it is. So all that brings us back to, I think, the, the importance of trying to develop some trans-substantive way of thinking about whether this sort of action is either permissible or desirable. And so let me turn to that and, and address the, the legal questions. I think there are actually three questions that are related but distinct in important ways that we're thinking. The first is what came up with Professor Tribe's talk, and in some ways the central issue is the scope of executive authority in its own right. And my own view, which has already come up, is that, that 
as a default matter, I think enforcement discretion is not a plenary executive authority to do whatever executive officials want. In particular, it's not an authority to change the content of substantive legal obligations. It's instead an authority to allocate resources, pursue one case or another because you, you can't do both, uh, but not to change the law itself. And so the, the puzzle that the marijuana and immigration policies present is that they formally respect that limit in the sense that they're both formally revocable, non-binding policies, don't, don't formally provide any assurance against for future enforcement, but at the same time, in functional terms, they push quite hard against that limit because in practice, they seem designed to change the on-the-ground law in ways that um, are quite significant. And I, as came out earlier, I think the immigration deferred action programs in particular are, are hard to fit within um, a limited conception of enforcement discretion. As I also said, I think the OLC opinion correctly recognized that problem and appropriately sought a justification more specific than just enforcement discretion writ large for the, for the program to prove. So that's the question of executive authority. The second question that's obviously now coming up in a big way with the Supreme Court case is what role courts can play in reviewing executive non enforcement policies. And here, of course, courts have been very reluctant to intrude on enforcement decisions. But I think the key question is really why? What's the right rationale for that judicial abstention or reticence? And you know, some cases describe it as a function of there being a, a preclusive executive prerogative. I think the better view is that it really reflects a problem of judicial manageability. That in a lot of contexts, courts have great trouble figuring out in a principled law-like way whether enforcement officials are focusing on the right things or the most important things, or even whether they're doing their best at all or taking the law seriously. And so I think what they've done is effectively treat law enforcement as a type of political question. And importantly, that means that, that they're not saying that there's no executive enforcement obligation. They're just uh, should be understood to be saying that whatever obligation there is, is subject to incomplete judicial enforcement. Now, last question is something I think hasn't gotten the attention it deserves, but came up in a question in the last panel. And that's the question of how to think about the reliance people are placing on these policies. So for example, with respect to marijuana, could, could a marijuana dispensary in Colorado uh, claim a reliance defense as a matter of due process or an estoppel if in the future some other administration prosecutes it for operating a, a dispensary that was seemed to be perfectly fine under the current enforcement policy, but, but views have changed. So I think in general, as Professor Tribe suggested, uh, and both as a matter of first principles and the case law in this area, the answer is no. And importantly, it, it has to be no because of the, the separation of powers limits on executive authority that I started with. So if executive officials could invite reliance on a non-enforcement policy and thereby create a reliance defense, then they would have that power to change the law itself um, that they don't have just as a matter of enforcement discretion. And then importantly, with respect to both these policies, is, is, is it accepted? Is it crucial to the, the claimed authority for the policy for them not to but that result, in effect, can be, could be quite harsh uh, because I, I doubt all the people placing reliance on these policies appreciate the risks that they're taking. And it also circles back to the political dynamics I started with. Uh, this sort of reliance question comes up in a lot of other contexts from administrative policies, SEC no action letters, undercover law enforcement investigations. And normally it just gets sorted out because the, the, the government keeps its promises, it's a matter of good government practice, even though there's no formal commitment. And in all likelihood, that will happen here too. But if the hallmark of the marijuana and immigration examples is uh, the salient and deliberate use of non-enforcement as a policy tool in areas of intense political contestation, then there could actually be a heightened risk, I think, that a future administration will in fact, as a matter of, of principle, reverse of this type of non-enforcement policy pursue enforcement and, and force the issue into courts where that, that one, the due process issue will rise more concretely. Uh, at any rate, it, it's actually come up several times already in the marijuana context, and so I think it's an aspect of the problem that's worth um, thinking about, where I'd love to hear folks' thoughts. Great, so what I want to do uh, after a quick introduction <coughs> is to sort of put on the table possible reasons for either non or under enforcement of specific kinds of laws and sort of ask what 
uh, one thinks about those, whether they are legitimate, illegitimate, and so forth. I should say at the outset um, that um, I sort of, uh, I agree with a lot of what Zach has written, with terrific stuff, it's great, it's, it's got two major pieces on this, I recommend it to all of you, one in the Vanderbilt Law Review, expounding on the, the duty of the president to execute the law, and then a forthcoming piece in the Notre Dame Law Review on the non-justiciability. I don't agree with everything he says, but it's, it's a really, I think it's a really comprehensive, terrific treatment of it. Um, the, so, so I want to tee it up by quoting uh, Justice Alito from the oral argument in Zubik. So uh, as you'll recall, the case involves the uh, RIFRA objection to the employer obligation to provide health insurance that covers contraception. And during the oral argument, one of the, uh, the main arguments of the plaintiffs is that uh, they are, they are, uh, the government's policy is not uh, the least restrictive means. And so a lot, of, a lot of argument focused on what alternatives there are. As you probably know, the court issued an unusual order uh, proposing one possibility. Uh, we'll see. But before that, Justice Alito was asking uh, Solicitor General uh, Don Verrilli, well, what about the following? He says, quote, and now I'm quoting, couldn't the executive deal with the problem of what's available on the exchanges at the present time in this way? Policies are available that provide comprehensive coverage. Could the executive say, as a matter of our enforcement discretion, we are not going to take any action against insurers who offer contraceptive-only policies, and in fact, we're going to subsidize those insurers at 115%, just as we do in the situation of the self-insured plans? To which the Solicitor General said no. Uh, and he gave his no had uh, multiple pieces to it. But one piece, and the piece that I want to focus on, is well, that, that's not legal. We couldn't do that. And of course, the reason Alito put it the way he did was Justice Alito thinks that that's the position that the Solicitor General is going to be defending with respect to uh, DAPA and expanded DACA in the United States against Texas. And so he said, well, if you, if you can do it there, can't you do this here? Uh, now, the, so the question is, why does the Solicitor General think that the authority he's claiming in the immigration case is uh, not as far, doesn't go as far as this authority that Justice Alito is hypothesizing? Uh, so the, the main reason, of course, is that he thinks, uh, the Solicitor General thinks, and the brief, uh, the brief makes this clear, that they are not giving people anything that's not already statutorily authorized on, in the immigration context. Whereas here, the, the reimbursement at 115%, that's, you know, that's money that hasn't been appropriated by Congress. It would be attempting to do something new through um, uh, the, the uh, ostensible exercise of prosecutorial discretion. But I think it's important to understand that um, in the immigration context, the government is not asserting a naked power just not to enforce the law at all, full stop. And so, but the question then, I think, is uh, what, what are the legitimate grounds for non-enforcement? So let me just sort of go through some conventional ones. So um, uh, the most obvious reason why uh, the government will exercise prosecutorial discretion is they think somebody is either not guilty or they have a weak, they might be guilty, but you have a weak case. And okay, I'm using a paradigm of criminal case, but it could be for civil enforcement or something else as well. Another possibility is you think that somebody is technically guilty, but that uh, they deserve mercy, right? This is somebody who, you know, um, uh, there are extenuating circumstances of the sort that the uh, legislature didn't mean to include, and that's part of the safeguards, of, of one of the safeguards of our system. Uh, then the one that everybody talks about are resource constraints, right? The government can't, doesn't have the resources to enforce every law to the full extent against uh, every possible violator. Uh, and the question then is, does that swallow up the entire field? Uh, because resource constraints are everywhere. Um, and so the next uh, point is, that so the government is going to say, we're not going to enforce this law because we have to set our priorities and there are all these other more important laws. And then the hard question becomes, well, when the government says that, how is that distinguishable from simply saying, here's some law and we disagree with the policy behind the law and we're not going to enforce it? So is that, is that uh, analytically distinct from saying it has a lower priority? Or to put it differently, where do these priorities come from? Now, in uh, Larry's uh, keynote, 
uh, with respect to immigration, he said that in that particular context, the, um, the prioritization comes from the values of the immigration law itself. Um, and uh, the <coughs> government makes an argument to that effect as well. Uh, I, I think it's a bit of a stretch uh, to say that the, the law itself provides for its own prioritization. Uh, in general, that's not the way laws work. And so even if it's not, even if, if that happens to be true in this context, it won't always be true, right? Congress or a state legislature passes a law, right, with either criminal or civil enforcement uh, contemplated. Uh, and it doesn't say, and this one is to be, you know, given priority level X, Y, or Z. They just say, there it is, that's another law. And so usually, it seems to me, the the basis for prioritization is going to have to be external to the statutory code. The government's going to have to get it from somewhere. And I think this, this to, to my mind, this is the, the reason why non-enforcement decisions ultimately can't be justiciable. Because even if the, the, the executive's, quote, real reason for deprioritizing some law is they just disagree with the policy of the law, that's going to be impossible to tease out. And often, it will be a legitimate deprioritization rather than re relative to some other sort of priority. OK, um, but I think we can, uh, I don't know if we, if we all can agree, but I certainly agree with Zach that if it were the case that the executive, the discussion within the executive was this law is constitutional, but we think it's a bad law. We have the resources to pursue it because there's some special you know, stream of funding, as there occasionally is, but we're just not going to do it because we think it's a stupid law. That would be highly problematic in my view. Um, uh, so the question then is, well, what other things are offered as justifications sort of internally within the executive branch that ought to either count or not count? So one thing we've talked about a little bit is gridlock. Um, and uh, we've sort of all accepted gridlock as a kind of fact. Uh, I should point out that there are people who disagree with this. My colleague Josh Chaffetz uh, uh, has been writing a lot in the last few years basically saying that gridlock is a myth. I disagree with him, but I thought I'd just point that out as a, uh, you know, to, a, bit of a point of conversation that, that, that when people say gridlock, they mean more or less what Marty was referring to before, right? which is uh, it's not gridlock if you have strong policy disagreements. It would be gridlock if you had things that were very popular um, that nonetheless couldn't get enacted. Now, I think that, that is an accurate description of where we are, but they, Congress doesn't enact nothing. And so the argument would be, no, there just is polarization. Polarization isn't necessarily gridlock. OK, but putting that aside, the uh, question is, if, if gridlock is a fact, is it a normative implication of gridlock that that justifies greater uh, executive decisions about non-enforcement in the same way that it might justify greater affirmative unilateralism in other contexts, right? Uh, so, you know, Congress, ju just as Congress's failure to act affirmatively will tend to lead the president to make creative arguments for having power to do stuff, so Congress's failure to repeal laws that are unpopular is going to, as a predictive matter, lead the president to under-enforce or non-enforce those laws. But that doesn't answer the question of whether that's a, a sufficient normative justification. And I think there's really no view from nowhere on that, on that question, right? Because uh, if it is the case that you think that there is you know, at least a minimally legitimate government, then it's very hard to say that Congress's failure to act is somehow a pathology rather than simply a policy Disagreement. So I'm skeptical of gridlock as a normative justification for executive unilateralism. Uh, one of the things Larry mentioned in his keynote is uh, federalism uh, with respect to the marijuana policy. Uh, and I, I think I, I, I'll, I can see that federalism can count, although I, I would be careful about it because it seems to me it's hard to distinguish federalism from simple uh, pol first order policy preferences. So let me give you another, another example. Suppose that uh, instead of a patchwork of states that had legalized <coughs> marijuana, there were a patchwork of states that had legalized lynching, right? Um, as we had effectively in the early 20th century, right? In those circumstances, I would hope 
that the federal government, federal executive's position would be, we are going to most zealously enforce federal law in the places, in the states in which there isn't overlapping state law, rather than saying, well, if you're okay with lynching, we're going to be okay with it as well. So what seems to me is driving the federal marijuana policy is not simply respect for the state policies of decriminalization or legalization, but uh, at least in substantial part, agreement with those state policies and thus disagreement with the uh, Federal Controlled Substance Act's inclusion of marijuana. Um, we might then ask, well, what else goes on could go on this list. And I don't really have an answer to that question, but I do think it's an important uh, question to think about. Uh, and you know, I'd be curious in the Q&A whether, uh, I was going to say any of the, uh, the government lawyers who who've thought about that from the sort of prosecutorial side uh, have thought about things that would justify the sort of systematic exercise of prosecutorial discretion not to enforce. And when I say systematic, I uh, I'm, I'm not taking a position on how formalized the policy has to be to rise to the level that Zach would say makes it um, impermissible as a general matter. I, I, don't, I don't have a strong view about that. Okay, I'll stop. Well, thank you. Uh, as I indicated this morning, I'm a fill-in here and, uh, and know less about the particulars of the uh, enforcement issues than uh, my co-panelists, and so what I thought I would do would be, as I in, as I suggested this morning, uh, talk a little about the idea of constitutional hardball, uh, with the uh, thought that that idea might uh, illuminate uh, some of these uh, more specific controversies. Uh, so the first thing is, what do I mean by constitutional hardball? Uh, and my basic thought is that uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. In times of uncontentious politics, or normal times, that's a little trickier uh, definition, um, the political system operates smoothly, at least in part, because uh, all of the participants, are, participants adhere to norms of proper behavior that are not uh, constitutionally compelled or written down in statutes or anything like that. Um, so uh, just to give you an example uh, of one, uh, one such norm which uh, still remains um, in place, I think. Uh, there's one prominent exception which I won't uh, mention uh, the details of. But uh, it, it is improper for for candidates to uh, use the young children of their opposing, uh, their opponents as targets somehow in, the, uh, in their campaigns. The kids are off bounds or out of bounds. You just can't talk about the kids. And that's true, actually, we saw that to some extent, uh, even if the candidate, the opponent, brings the kids in. Uh, so Bobby Jindal had his kids in his first announcement, but it would have been in inappropriate, and nobody did. Uh, say, people said, well, that's a little weird, but they didn't say anything about the kids themselves. Okay, so that's the kind of norm uh, I, I, I have in mind. Um, now, uh, uh, these norms operate uh, uh, both with respect to presidents, with the, the president, and with respect to Congress. Uh, when I wrote, and, and since most of my thinking has been about Congress, uh, I, so let me just mention one uh, current example. Uh, until now, <coughs> there was a norm that, uh, I, it's actually an interesting question when it began, but a norm that uh, that senators would have courtesy call meetings with nominees to the Supreme Court. Uh, they could say, and they would say uh, at those meetings, uh, you know, I'm not going to vote for you. Uh, I don't recall who was, who was quoted in that, but in, in connection with either Justice Kagan or Justice Sotomayor or Justice Alito, I don't, um, there were people who held the meetings and in those meetings said, you're a fine person, but I'm not going to vote for you. Uh, 
so, so that was a norm. Now uh, there was no requirement for these meetings. And as I say, there was a time in, in our history when they didn't occur. Uh, but the current situation is one in which there is a, uh, uh, the, the, that norm has been uh, uh, abandoned or, or weakened. Uh, that's what I mean by co uh, congressional hard, by hardball at the uh, congressional level. Uh, what about uh, uh, pres uh, hardball at the uh, presidential level? Uh, well, here are a couple of examples, and, and I want to start with one from the George W. Bush administration. So um, I may not get the details of this right, but the big picture is, I'm, I'm confident, is, is correct. <coughs> Environmental statutes ought have uh, timelines attached to them. So once the uh, White House, um, that's right, right, once the White House receives a submitted rule, uh, it has a limited time uh, to respond to it. Uh, I don't know what the details are, and the time can be extended, but a clock starts running once you receive the email. Uh, in the George W. Bush administration, with respect to, I think it's the global warming rule, the, the tailpipe emissions rule, but in any event, with respect to one rule from the EPA, the EPA developed the rule, uh, sent it to the White House via email, and I don't know technologically how this was done, but the White House deliberately did not open the email for the purpose of preventing the clock from starting running. Okay, so that's hardball. You know, uh, um, it's not on the constitutional level, but it's, you know, the norm would be you get the emails and you see what's in them. Uh, uh, moving forward, uh, at, and why I bring the uh, George W. Bush in administration into it uh, will become clear, I hope, in a moment. <coughs> With respect to uh, the Obama administration, <laughs> <coughs> um, claims about constitutional hardball have been made uh, in, uh, uh, I'll use a couple of examples from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, on the most general level, uh, opponents of the Affordable Care Act say, say uh, prior to the adoption of the Affordable Care Act, there was a norm that the, we would not, the, the government as a whole would not move forward towards the adoption of a major social program unless that program had bipartisan support. Okay, so the Obama administration actually on this story, uh, or at least on a, a story, on a version that would be consistent with this, actually tried to uh, get bipartisan support worked reasonably hard at getting it, uh, but failed to do so. Now, the story, uh, the hardball story is, under the existing norm, when you were not able to get bipartisan support, you would give up on the program. Instead, the Obama administration played hardball by moving forward with a major social program that uh, was that that did not have uh, bipartisan support. That's the most general version. Uh, uh, a lower level version is the uh, adoption of the uh, interpretation of uh, state exchanges that was at issue in King and Burwell. Uh, everybody knew. Uh, I think this is a fair characterization that in other circumstances. Uh, <coughs> the, this statutory glitch would have been solved by the enactment of a Technical Corrections Act. Uh, uh, the, it was just a, a glitch, no, uh, but under the circumstances, that was unavailable, and so the administration uh, uh, bulled its way through to an interpretation of the statute that is uh, um, difficult to defend. Turns out the court agreed with it, but uh, oh, you know, I, I won't go into why uh, the court agreed with it. But the use of the reinterpretation of the statute 
is an example uh, of Hargill. Uh, now, in the context of under enforcement, uh, I just want to make uh, a couple of uh, points. Uh, 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 the question is, is under enforcement an example of hardball uh, being played by the administration? Um, one possible answer is yes, it is. This is suggested by a comment that Judge Kavanaugh made uh, in uh, the prior session. Uh, uh, when the Obama administration says, we are going to adopt these programs, these enforcement programs, because Congress has not enacted the statute uh, that would do it, uh, that is uh, a breach of a norm that you, you know, get this sort of thing done by, uh, by Congress. Uh, uh, on the other, so that seems to me, you know, you can fairly characterize the under enforcement in, in the in immigration context as uh, hardball by the president. Uh, but as, as I think Michael's uh, presentation suggests in particular, you could also say, no, it's not hardball, uh, because this is a little trickier, but there were no pre-existing norms uh, about enforcement priorities. Um, it's, uh, no is a little uh, strong, uh, but there certainly was no norm that, that uh, you uh, had to, it's sort of the only alternative, not the only alternative, you had to institute deportation proceedings, removal proceedings, I guess they are now technically called, removal proceedings against anybody who comes to your attention in the order in which they come to your attention. Okay? That's actually pretty much what uh, line officers in uh, the, uh, the enforcement bureaucracy were doing. Uh, but uh, that, I don't think, people would defend that as a, a norm rather than just a practice. Okay, so those are examples of uh, uh, constitutional hardball uh, played by the president. Now there are a couple of things that I want to say about this uh, in addition, more general things. The first is um, because we're dealing with norms, uh, they're unwritten. And so uh, they are, as I would put it, even more contestable than uh, statute-based arguments, which we had a discussion about how contestable those are. But if you don't have a, a written nor a, a, a written text to go to, uh, then the characterization of the norm will itself be open to quite substantial contestation. Uh, and so some people will. <coughs> <coughs> will say, well, no, we're not paying, we're not playing hardball because there was no norm of the sort that you say there was. Here, here too, the uh, easier example is uh, uh, on the congressional side in connection with the uh, Garland nomination. Uh, uh, the, the supporters of the nomination say there's a norm of an up and down vote even in the fourth year of a presidency unless it's much closer to the election than, uh, than uh, we, are, we are now. And the uh, supporters of the, uh, the opponents of the nomination say, no, there was no such norm. If you look at the precedents, it turns out that, well, I don't know, the last time there was an up and down, uh, up or down vote on a, a nomination in a presidential year where the nomination was made in uh, uh, March uh, was 138 years ago, or something like that. Uh, so there is no, no such norm uh, that you're, okay, so um, one of the things uh, that is, I find interesting about this, uh, these kinds of discussions is that you would think that, uh, uh, the, the, the claims about breaches of norms uh, would not involve what I think of as lawyering up, making lawyer-like arguments about whether there was a norm and whether this activity is breached. But the example of was there a precedent for what the Senate is doing indicates that people actually do lawyer up with respect to uh, norms as well. Uh, the final comment or final observation I want to make or final set of questions I want to raise is uh, when does constitutional hardball occur? Uh, now, uh, in some of the uh, responses to my idea, uh, 
there's a suggestion that, uh, contrary to what I said in my initial presentation, uh, constitutional hardball actually has, happens all the time. Um, I think that can't be right, uh, precisely because the idea of constitutional hardball is that in normal times, these issues do not come up. That is, people adhere to the norms. Uh, and so the question for me is uh, when, when does co constitutional hardball uh, occur? Uh, and, and here I think uh, the phrase that Zach used earlier, that there's a crescendo of uh, developments, is uh, suggestive. Uh, I thought, I still, still do think, that constitutional hardball is characteristic of uh, transitional periods, uh, uh, periods of transition between uh, one of Skoranek's uh, regimes and another. Uh, the, the critics of that claim uh, would be, would, would say, as some have, that uh, this is a really long transition. Uh, if I can go back to the Bush administration, you know, we're talking 15 or 16 years. Uh, that's not a transition. You know, this is what it's Gloria Steinem's line about, you don't look like 60 years old. And she said, this is what 60 years, 60 years old looks like. Uh, so this is, the norm is constitutional hardball. Okay, so there, that's the thought. I don't, I still uh, think, I, I, I remain convinced that uh, the, the, that a hardball is characteristic of transitional be periods, and b uh, we are uh, in a, a quite long transition, uh, which um, my guess is uh, may be coming. The transitional period may be coming to a close. Um, the final observation actually picks up on uh, something Bruce said about. Uh, the Enlightenment method of, uh, of uh, constitutional design. Uh, what I, one way of characterizing uh, constitutional hardball is to uh, refer to uh, the title of uh, one of uh, Goya's etchings. Uh, and uh, the title is uh, The Sleep of Reason begets monsters. Uh, so hardball is a monster. Uh, and it occurs when enlightenment constitutional design goes to sleep. Uh, and that's what happens in transitions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to first on echo Mike's comments about Zach's articles, which are outstanding. I've been teaching separation of powers for a decade now. And this topic in particular, the prosecutorial discretion, enforcement discretion topic, there's a dearth of scholarship. And uh, I think it's one of the hardest questions in constitutional law. And Zach's filled the void with some, some excellent uh, thoughts and articles about it. So I did want to echo that. But now I want to push on the, on the limits because uh, on categorical non-enforcement, Akhil Lamar would say, well, it's just the mere image of the pardon power. And the pardon power is ex expressed and it's absolute. And the president tomorrow could pardon everyone in federal prison and could decide to pardon any future violators. And, and we did see the president, I think yesterday, commute a bunch of sentences. Uh, statute couldn't get through Congress on sentencing reform, so commuting sentences, which is uh, an express power. So why not allow the president to not prosecute in the first place if he could just pardon everyone at the back end? And then just connected to that, isn't it all connected to the idea of separation of powers and liberty in the, in, to begin with, again, to push a little, which is Congress didn't, uh, the convention, the framers did not want to unite the enactment power and the enforcement power in one person or one body. One body enacts, another body makes an independent decision to enforce and may disagree with the law, but that's a protection of individual liberty for the people. In other words, two different bodies have to come to a decision to bring the law 
throw that to you. Why why are there limits at all? Why is it like the Barton Tower? Sure. Well, so those are great questions and, and hard ones. I mean, I think the pardon power, I mean, the first thing to say about it is that it would only apply to the criminal cases. So it wouldn't cover situations like immigration or other civil enforcement. Uh, but I think more generally, even in the criminal context, and you know, this is not everyone agrees with this, obviously, but I, I think you could just as well say the pardon power actually carries a negative inference that if you're going to, to tailor laws and you don't like the law, that the thing to do is to pardon people, not to, to not enforce. So the way I think about it is I think, um, and in terms of the separation of powers architecture more broadly, um, well, on the other hand, then you have the <coughs> care clause, which, which modern cases frequently invoke as a source of a, a basis for enforcement discretion, but, it, but really, literally, it says the opposite. I mean, it says that the, pre the president creates a duty of faithful enforcement. So I think if you, if you sort of at baseline, the way you fit this together is that, um, that the separate <coughs> powers do, is intended to create some space between well, the enacted law and its application. But here's where I think that the core default rule should be that there's a, it's a kind of case-specific application. So the legislative function is to create general rules, the executive function is to apply them in particular cases, and that creates some you know, safety valve to, to not apply the law in every case. Now, the problem, what makes the cases we're dealing with hard is that that breaks down when you get something like immigration where you, you could not apply the law in that way with the available resources, and there the problem gets harder. But as a kind of matter of just the formal separation of powers, I think that's the, the right structure. And we're generally I think pardons compared to non-enforcement, on the one hand, it seems like a futile undertaking to prosecute if you're, if you're going to end up pardoning, but they do have different a different kind of salience and different legal effects. In particular, the pardon power once exercised is definitive. Uh, you know, it's conclusive. It precludes future enforcement. Can also maybe carry certain collateral legal effects. Whereas non-enforcement is something you can do, um, you know, behind the scenes. Um, Think. And so that those are important differences that might explain why Congress should be able to limit enforcement discretion even if it can't take away the pardon power. I will say on the reliance question, I actually think that, that I highly doubt this will happen, but the president might think about using the pardon power um, to, to solve the reliance problem with people who, who committed crimes that could be prosecuted in the future in reliance on a non-enforcement policy. I think it may always be better if presidents actually did use the pardon power instead of non-enforcement, um, partly for that, for that reason. And, and the pardon power you can do as soon as the act is committed. You don't have to wait until there's actually a prosecution or conviction, that's, at least yeah. under Supreme Court precedent. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, which is a little bit of an oddity, but you can imagine a blanket pardon policy. As soon as you've committed this act, you are hereby pardoned. It, 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 or, uh, no, it's unclear whether that power extends to giving it before the, before the conduct. Before the conduct. Well, wait, so that's another like another that. important difference that, that may is sort of subtle in terms of framing, but I think, it, I mean, non-enforcement, the, the, the pardon equivalent of a non-enforcement policy would be a promise that I'll pardon you after you do it, after the fact. Right. And maybe that's, maybe that's the same as saying, you know, having a non-enforcement policy or promise of non-enforcement I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I feel like the non-enforcement 
different. So now, um, the president, the modern president, the post, you know, the 20th century, had these two things. One, he is a political actor. He vetoes legislation, for example, as the paradigm. He's a, he's a political actor. And then he is the manager of the bureaucratic state. Um, so when we have um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, in a, uh, and so we could talk about this in the evolution of immigration law, for example, uh, in which uh, uh, the modern bureaucratic administration of the, of the integration laws, which is why it's really post-first post world war, for sure, I think. Um, the, uh, now, so we say, okay, there are standard operating bureaucratic reasons for proceeding. Um, so, for example, you have a fixed budget. You, uh, uh, this, is this is the classic problem of a bureaucratic state. Uh, you can't enforce everything. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and I thought that Larry did a nice job of putting that into the context of the immigration thing. So the civil versus criminal, you see, that's uh, a, a pretty bureaucratic state criteria, I think. Uh, it's what kind of institution is active. Okay, then we have, let's say, uh, uh, the uh, 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 the president as a constitutional actor, making and defining public policy. Okay. Now, one dimension of this that we see is, let's say, old IRA, or really from 1978, when we first basically, in the Carter administration, uh, we have the cost of living council of global law up to OIRA. Now this is a, a new institution, this is Elena Kagan presidential administration, that is, um, the president is now taking a much more active and responsible role in the management of the bureaucratic state. The classic statutes are directed to, you know, the Secretary of the Interior, <laughs> the X, the Y. And now, the so that's one place where um, it does seem to me um, that uh, is a fascinating um, set of issues. I, I believe, for example, Cass Sunsey, that just in practice under the uh, uh, in OIRA was violated the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, uh, the, uh, if one really thought about what the Administrative Procedure Act is trying to do and what Cass Sunstein is trying to do, which is to get out of and get, force the agencies not to do that, but to use cost benefit. Um, but so um, the uh, uh, if so my take or invitation into your thing is if what we're seeing is not enforcement et cetera and so forth uh, we are very familiar with the standard repertoire of bureaucratic management rationales if they are you know we could take the flavor plausibly compellingly whatever uh, within that ambit that's really a and it might create vested interest and political consequences. Of course, that's true. Um, uh, but um, nonetheless, that's very different from a use, which is also legitimate, the president being one of the you know, lawmakers, <laughs> after all, the veto uh, is a part of the legislative process. And, and uh, the Federalist Papers are all about how our system of separation of uh, powers is not each institution has a separate power, but they inter interact with one another. So the initial characterization question, before we get to the constitutional um, uh, Marx uh, 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 hardball, is, is this within the standard repertoire of bureaucratic management techniques? Or not, and of course it's going to, or is this within the understood to be a part of the equally legitimate presidential function in lawmaking and et cetera. Uh, and that should be the initial characterization. Of course, that initial characterization is going to lead to all these, all of the standard problems of characterization. But, um, uh, I, uh, but I, I prefer that to the thing that was put, was invoked, this is the name, of course, of Keela Barr, and the notion that the pardon power, because I'm with you, you see, but for a different kind of reason. Here, the pardon power is a classic thing coming out of the 18th century. The supreme magistrate exercising the power of pardon, uh, fitting into that quasi-judicial role 
But that's quite different from, uh, it seems to me, and you're right, that uh, these other things, but I wouldn't characterize this as civil, and I would want to push this initial characterization issue, not while absolutely admitting that there may be hard cases of characterization. Can I uh, just pick up on the bureaucratic versus lawmaker uh, distinction? One way of telling the story uh, about uh, DACA and DAPA <coughs> is, excuse me, is a bureaucratic managerial story. So the administration had put in place a set of enforcement priorities that had the form of saying, we will devote our uh, removal resources to people who have committed crimes in the United States. Uh, I assume for the moment that that is the 400,000 people. I actually don't know that, but there are a lot of people in that category. It turns out that the, this is, I think, uh, also a true story, the line officers in the enforcement bureaucracy don't follow that prioritization. They actually begin removal proceedings against anybody who comes to their attention. Uh, and you could tell the uh, DACA DAPA story as uh, saying, look, we're, this is a better way of ensuring that the enforcement priorities that we've already established will be followed by these line officers. Uh, okay, so I think I'll stop with that. Yeah, so one interesting factor about that, I don't know if you saw earlier this week, the uh, Border Patrol Agents Union endorsed Donald Trump for president. Um, and, right, so, so one way of thinking about this. Because they don't have to build the wall. Well, sure. <laughs> well, no, they don't have to pay for it. Um, the, the, yeah, nobody has to pay for it. Right. Uh, <laughs> But so, you know, so you could, a, a sort of more provocative way to put the point Mark just made is you can think of these policies as sort of furthering a vision of the unitary executive. Right? It's the way of the, of the president to get the, to control policy. Charles. Uh, on the immigration, did I not hear somebody saying whether it was Larry or someone earlier that DACA and DACA in fact, are authorized in the statute itself in terms of the authorization to work. The attorney general has the right, has the- It was uh, Marty. That was the, it was <laughs> Marty, Mar Mar sorry. So, Mar so yeah, I think it's, we're talking a lot. The focus of this has been on the decision not to remove and deport. Yeah. So One thing that's really interesting about the litigation is that very, very quickly, To remove, to remove the, the discretion not to remove. It's entirely about, in part because Heckler versus Cheney, it's entirely about what I might call the ancillary authorities to a grant work authorization, which has the subsidiary effect of, of allowing employers to hire such aliens in the way they otherwise would. And that's all. And to grant them social security. And, and, to, and to grant them social security benefits. Well, no, the debate is whether the statute does authorize those affirmative grants or not. Texas says they don't, the United States says they do, and that's what the debate is about. But it has complete, there, there's, no, there's no longer anything in the case about the <coughs> Yeah, the prosecutorial but, discretion's out of the case, isn't it? Or is it in not? The, in the prosecutorial discretion about removal. The yeah, prosecutorial about discretion removal. about work authorization and social security benefits is very much in the case. But, but, but they that's, say that's not prosecutorial discretion. That's right. the character. It's discretion, right. It's yeah. affirmative yeah. grant. But yeah. that yeah. thing yeah. Uh, does uh, take some of the heat off this subject of the removal power. Because obviously, if you say the person can get social security and can work, you're also, also not going to remove the money that's uh, a fortiori. So no, it, it works. The other way, this actually ties to the question I was going to ask, which is the story. I'm going to try to be fair to Texas's side of the story here, which is I, I don't agree with this. But this is what they're arguing. They say that the immigration statute, seen as a whole, is supposed to have the people who are not authorized to 
undermines the whole point of the immigration. But Marty, if there is, and the government, well, yes, and the government, the government is. <laughs> author is, is arguing that it is in the statutes. It is, the, oh, absolutely, it's totally, it's, it's completely a statutory argument from the government's perspective. The government's argument, though, Charles, is that the reason to grant people work authorization and to give them social security benefits, even though they are removable and are not authorized to enter the United States, is this is where it gets complicated. It's sort of twofold. Number one, it's an inevitability. It has always been the case that many people who don't have author authorization to enter the United States will be here. And as long as they're going to be here, it's better they be part of the of the of the the, the above board working in communities, providing for their families, paying their taxes on the record and the like, rather than being part of a shadow economy and, and, and with all the problems that that causes. But secondly, and this gets, what I wanted to get at was, I think we're too quick to say this is non-enforcement or under-enforcement. I think you have to look statute by statute. And what's interesting is the statute, there's no requirement that the aliens leave the country, not no express requirement. There's no statutory directive to the executive branch to remove anyone that the duty to remove comes from two sources. One is the take care clause, perhaps. You might think the executive branch has a, a take care duty, or the president does, to get private parties to comply with the law by, by threatening or actually enforcing that law. And or the appropriation, which is we're giving you a bunch of money for the obvious purpose of removing at least some of these people so, so that you're there. But there's no law that says the executive branch if, it, if we only have the funds, we'd like all 11 million unauthorized aliens to leave the United States. Donald Trump thinks that, but Congress doesn't. And, and, right? and Congress, in that respect, it's different from a criminal statute, is it right. not? In that respect, it is, because you might say that every criminal prohibition, does, that it's fair at least to presume that Congress intends that no one should violate those criminal prohibitions. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's accompanied by a penalty. We don't, well, we don't want under enforcement because we don't want anyone to do those things. The immigration law, I mean, this is Adam Cox and Christina Rodriguez's argument in Toronto, right, um, is much more complex over the decades than that. And it reflects, a, it, as I was saying about work authorization, a real complex of values and objectives, some of which are inconsistent with one another. And it's not simply a statute about no unauthorized aliens should be in the United States or working, which is the story that Texas is trying to tell. In fact, the immigration laws reflect a very, very heavily negotiated over many decades compromise between many different values. I'm sounding like a public choice to this. Yeah, between many good. different values. But Marty, <laughs> all, all I intended to do when I brought this up, it, it, it's right. turned out that there's even more here, is that this is not a non-enforcement uh, by some policy which the government has, which is uh, just drawn out of the air. Oh, no, absolutely yeah. not. The, government, the executive branch is is asserting completely statutory authority, yeah. consistent well, with Congress's wishes. That's the story. So, so in fact, the, uh, the immigration laws are different from the drug laws. Yeah. So yeah. says the administration. I mean, this is this is why I've been saying for a couple of years now that I think the harder question is the marijuana policy. Right. It's yeah. just that it's politically easier because nobody, nobody wants the federal government, well, not nobody, but almost nobody really wants aggressive enforcement of marijuana, federal amount marijuana in states where it's legal. Right. So that's, that's an I, interesting I question, Mike. Is that, I mean, is, so it's one of these things Mark was talking about before, old, and Richard was talking about. At the time, the Controlled Substances Act is enacted. Of course, Congress wants nobody right. to be smoking marijuana anywhere. Right. It right. hasn't revisited the question since Colorado and Washington legalized it under their law. So, what are we supposed to do under this? That's right. I, I, I didn't want to let something that Bruce said go by without being questioned. Uh, it seemed to me that your <laughs> state was recognized in Mosley against Madison. Uh, you look at that incredible decision by Marshall, and it talks about the, uh, the president's establishment, and it talks about 
various uh, secretaries and like, it's the uh, it's the foundation of administrative law oddly enough it, it, it's quite remarkable in that respect and as to saying that this is all that uh, recent uh, FDRs I think it was uh, I think it was his, uh, one of his somebody that was in his establishment who wrote uh, he, he was the father of the, prof uh, of the professor here in Harvard who has the name of the political science guy I don't mean to but let you keep on talking about the uh, and, and he explained when Roosevelt was chafing under the existence of the uh, controller general and also the independent this is a mistake and he expressed the idea uh, that the president is the general manager this is the phrase is the general manager of the United States uh, well you can't get more of a bureaucratic state than that yes that's the birth of Europe that's the birth of the legitimation of bureaucratic state that's to former against Madison now by the way you get a sense Charles and I were a member of a group of uh, people for 25 years who got together each month. Uh, it was called, Bob knows your name, but SELF, uh, the Society for Ethical and Legal Philosophy. So I'm used to uh, Charles not getting him, not, not thinking that he's not letting me get away with something. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, um, but you're absolutely right. We have, uh, in the First Bank of the United States, and then in the second, the First Bank of the United States is, and this is embarrassment to Steve Calabresi and such. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, 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 we have, mm, this is sort of uh, a mixed economy solution in which the U.S. has minority shareholding rights in the First Bank of the United States um, and is uh, managing the money supply um, um, and then we, quite right, and Marshall, of course, is there and believes in this tremendously. It's not the bureaucratic state, though. This is the, um, uh, what I mean by the bureaucratic state is bureaucracy. <laughs> uh, a system of hierarchical uh, uh, structure uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and that we begin uh, uh, in a good way, uh, you know, like the, 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 the problem with reconstruction uh, is that the only way of enforcing um, the, <coughs> no, the new national norms is through the bureaucracy called the U.S. military. Uh, there was no other bureaucrat, bureaucracy like that. Um, what we have, well, you're quite right though, that what Marshall was trying to do is to say this elite group in Philadelphia is to be, you know, to be heated <laughs> Uh, and you state folks aren't going to get in the way with, of, of this effort to nationally operate the, uh, the money supply and things of this kind. Um, Harvey Mansfield, that's, that's right. Uh, good for you. <laughs> Harvey, uh, but when, when, the, uh, uh, when, Roosevelt is, uh, when Roosevelt is talking, you know, uh, he is moving from uh, these uh, particular um, institutions of the independent agencies and things of this kind to the genuine construction of a bureaucracy. Consider the Hatch Act in 1930, which is an effort to immunize them from political intervention and things of this kind. So uh, that's what, and that's what uh, in the Prussian state, you know, oh, the, yeah, they, they, they were they have, so class. Yeah, well, but they, you know, the, 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 the general code of Frederick uh, the Great, Frederick the Great declares himself the first civil servant of the state. And he then has this elaborate code to instruct the bureaucrats underneath him. Um, that looks like uh, the EPA. <laughs> can, I, let me, can I ask about it? But that, that, that. So, that, so we're not disagreeing about mm -hmm. the significance of Warbury against Madison, but we are the, the, that's different from the construction of a bureaucratic. I think, I, you know, on the broader point about is this just 
you know, normal, the administrative state, because it's the same sort of problem we've, we've settled in the 1930s. I think there are some important differences conceptually, and I, I, the, the problem is probably what, what Mike was alluding to earlier, that when the government affirmatively regulates, even if there's a, a just a fairly general statute, there's a standard in the statute against which to measure the government's action, which is, you know, are they, is this a reasonable interpretation of the policy if they exceeded the authority that's been conferred on them? The big problem with enforcement is that, as Mike was suggesting, in a general way you can tie it to values reflected in the statute, but at some level what you prioritize is a relatively ungoverned choice about what's most important. You know, if you can't do everything, what, what should you focus on? And that's why, to my mind, the, the limit that's more important is, is a formal one of the degree of, of definiteness in the expression of, of, of the enforcement policy. That's one thing that makes it an enforcement policy rather than um, a substantive rule. But uh, a broader, another broader point that your comments bring out is I do think one way to understand the crescendo, as I described, and this is not my argument, but there's an article by Kate Andreas that makes this argument that the pattern we're seeing is the development of presidential enforcement that parallels the development of presidential administration. I think it raises a lot of the same vices and virtues in terms of you know, increased accountability in the president, but also increased potential conflict between the way that administrative state or enforcement agencies are operating and the, the vision of the, of the statutes that, that Congress wanted. As to something uh, you said and Mike said, Mike said the marijuana example is hard. And let's probe that for a second. Uh, let's assume plenty of resources, yep. so it's not a resource right. decision. It's purely a policy decision about what we think is appropriate to prosecute. And it sounds like we don't have a good answer as to whether that's up or down. Yeah. So can I, so can I take legal, Which is a real problem, right. and this is for the state of the legal community. <coughs> the president could come in on January 20th and say, okay, counsel, I don't want to enforce X laws. Is that legal or not? And we have a lot of smart people in this room and elsewhere, and we don't have a great answer to that question, right? Yes. And presidents tend to like yes or no's to questions. So I think the answer that both <laughs> I think the answer that both Zach and I would give is if you just don't like the law, you don't want to enforce it, the answer is no. Uh, no court's gonna stop you from doing that, however. Uh, and so then you say then there's a sort of legal realist question, well, is that really the law? My view I say our view is that yes, it's still the law. There are legal obligations that are not judicially enforceable. The conventional question, then, then sort of, well, so how does it, so how does it get, get enforced? Well, the conventional answer is through constitutional politics, by which I don't mean what Bruce, like politics during a constitutional moment. I mean politics about constitutional questions, like we're seeing over the Garland nomination and ultimately uh, through elections. So the next thing, though, is that resources can always be, and this is one of my concerns about resources, is you can always, even though you said the answer would be no to that question, mm -hmm. resources can almost always be smuggled in as, okay, well, we're right. not doing That's it because right. we don't like the law, we're doing it because this is how we want to direct our resources, but isn't that a bit of a ruse in certain yeah. cases? It's no, I think it's being honest, of course it's but I also want to, I do want what to if Congress that. says you have all the resources you need? So that, this is what's interesting. Congress doesn't say that. So I, they it, never say so that. No, they do occasionally. So uh, as Zach knows from internal OLC, very rare occasions. Very rare occasions. That he and I have worked on. But there have been times in our history, once was a civil rights statute passed that was trying to force the executive branch to enforce civil rights statute. Congress does occasionally say you must enforce in the following situations. The executive branch has construed that to be non justiciable. Occasionally, they've made arguments like that violence to take care clause. I agree with Zach that it doesn't. Congress can require enforcement. They could say, go anytime you see someone in Colorado smoking a joint. You so must arrest them. Deportation. If they, if Congress said, absolutely. So what I want, to deport, but I want to suggest it's not disingenuous or pretextual to say, oh, there's not enough resources. Of course, if there's not enough resources, the thing you're going to spend the least on, maybe zero, are going to be the statutes you think are outmoded, anachronistic, obsolete, stupid. Right, you're going to, and every administration does this. Yes. We're going to do child porn instead of, yep. you know, RIFRA. We're going to do this instead of that. And and what I want to say is that's not necessarily inconsistent with legislative intent, right? And this is a this is obvious 
we all know it. Congress has quite deliberately over the last 50 to 100 years in the criminal law context uh, prohibited two thirds of the things you do during the day <laughs> on the assumption that, on the assumption that, the, you know, starting with organized crime and a bunch of small little technical tax violations and the like, we want the executive branch to make decisions about what's most worthy of prosecuting and going after and what's not. That's consistent with our charge. We don't want 100% enforcement of all the criminal laws. I mean, maybe someone does. But so I, don't think, I, you're I just want to resist this idea that in, a, in an ideal world, if you had all the money, Congress would want all of its laws enforced all of its still time. Would. And, I think and there's built point, in discretion. Your point is there's a background norm, I think, correct me, a background norm of prosecutorial discretion under enforcement unless and until Congress explicitly directs. Uh, I'm not uh, sure, Brad, but I, I, if I could, maybe in, that's criminal, a in, the, in, the, in the criminal law, I think there might be a background norm like that, but I would want to think about it more. What I do think is that one has to look at each step very carefully, right. including the immigration. Well, let me, let me kind of for a, uh, uh, for a, a concrete right. hypo. I mean, so I think this is where the presidential enforcement aspect of it matters because, yes, there are tons of laws that are never enforced and basically because everyone agrees that they're not important. And maybe marijuana sort of fits there. That might be one way to explain the politics of marijuana. But the, I think the risk with these examples is if you start doing that in areas that are more contentious. And I think the flip side of marijuana to think about is I, th I think it's nine states now have laws that specifically authorize well, in intrastate production of guns in violation of federal law, and the administration quite properly responded to, by, you know, threatening prosecution against people who, who, who breach those. But how do we think about a president who's sympathetic to gun rights and, and takes a different view and says, "This is federalism. This is local preference. I'm going to let them do this." So that's a kind of concrete example of the of the flip side of it. To and there are a lot of other it. examples. Yeah. I mean. They, Environmental enforcement, enforcement of the health care law, with a president who's not can't get it repealed, but is hostile to the health care law. Long and, and, and systematically, I think, and this is the point Zach made earlier, right? He's made in another paper, right? It's going to be liberals and progressives who are going to want Correct. enforcement, and conservatives who are so going to want more not enforcement. Yes. Usually, that's going to be the yeah. point. So I just want to shift focus slightly um, because you know, quite understandably. thus far on, you know, these sort of policy type non-enforcement decisions, right, as Act so beautifully lays out uh, in that paper. Um, but, you know, and throughout, there's kind of this underlying premise that what happens all the time and what in contrast is not particularly problematic is, you know, the fact that most laws are massively under-enforced, they're not enforced in a hill, case-by-case -case discretion is okay. Um, but I want to raise the question of, what if any the limits are of case by case discretion? And I have a very, and, and I know that's very, I love case by case, no pun intended. Um, and so, so I have a very specific hypothetical in mind or, or case in mind, which is um, uh, the Espionage Act statute as applied to completely classified information, right? Um, so, so the, idea, idea. With the prohibition on, on, on publishing any information right. about cryptography right. or, or, or yeah. surveillance yeah. capabilities. Yeah. It's violated yeah. every day. Right. Oh, a absolutely. Yeah. Whether it applied to leakers or publishers. Right. Le I mean, leakers is kind of more in the news, right. and, you know. But so, yeah, so we have, as you guys probably all know, you know, not an official Secrets Act, but nonetheless an Espionage Act statute that's worded broadly enough that really pretty much anyone from the White House on down who discloses classified information and all know so much is classified, right? Um, is is technically guilty, right, of violating the Espionage Act. Um, and as we know, you know, hardly ever prosecuted. Variety of reasons. David Posen actually has a great article about this, about why it might, you know, hardly ever be prosecuted. It's been controversial. It's in the Obama administration, we've had eight or nine prosecutions. So, you know, the question is, in a context like that, you kind of have the classic example of wildly under enforced law seems to be entirely case by case when there's a decision to prosecute, not some grand transparent policy statement. Um, 
But yet, I think a lot of us have at least the intuition that that's very problematic, um, you know, potentially because it's, in, in this case, because of the free speech implications, et cetera. I was wondering if you guys have any, any thoughts on that, because this seems to me almost the polar opposite of a situation where you have kind of the policy type enforcement versus non enforcement dichotomy, very case by case, but maybe problematic in its own right. Or maybe that's too generous because of the First Amendment. I think it, I mean, it's one thought, I don't know if you want to, no. one thought that connects a lot of these areas is the, the theme Marty raised of, of one reason I, I think of enforcement discretion as not a great thing is because it enables laws like that to exist, right? So you have this prohibition right. that survives only because it's never enforced. And then, then you get a case where somebody breaks it in a high profile way, and a lot of people say, oh, that's a crime, they should go to, go to prison. And what do we do? So the, you know, one, my kind of formalist inclination is that you know, if the laws were enforced more generally all along, then we wouldn't be in the situation to begin with, but that's not a realistic solution today. And so I think you know, this is why it's incredibly important for particularly criminal prosecutors to understand the level of real discretion that they have and not, not every crime is, is a reason to send them to jail. But isn't that also a reason to celebrate prosecutorial discretion because we have a thick body of laws, many of which are oppressive and rarely enforced. Some people think different laws are oppressive, whatever. That prosecutorial discretion is a check on that and a, a break uh, of preservation of liberty. Uh, except it invites surprising Aggressive and discriminatory uh, right. enforcement. I mean, yeah. something uh, like Russia or China. Yeah, I mean it, it, that's the downside, right? I mean that's the problem. That's why this is such a hard question, I think. Because I mean, there's a check on oppressive laws. You wouldn't want every law enforced. You'd rather have them repealed. But if they're not repealed, you'd rather have a check. But you don't want discriminatory. Well, there's, right? there's a dispute right now before the American. Zealot, who is proposing to uh, change the law on sexual assault in a way that's completely uh, out of sync with the way human beings live their lives. Uh, but it's, oh, but it's a good example that what it would be is an invitation to the occasional discriminatory and oppressive arbitrary uh, enforcement for some other reason. Well, that's why in, in oral arguments on these two occasions, the SG has cited prosecutorial discretion to the Chief Justice as a, as a fail-safe, and the Chief has responded, we don't usually rely on, on the good graces of the executive uh, yeah, as a yeah. preservation of liberty. It's the, I mean, just one thought, which is, there's a distinction between destitute, as in oh, yeah. the espionage act, what we actually have is destitute, and then and prosecutorial discretion, uh, and uh, uh, and yeah, I, mean, I mean the uh, and that's uh, uh, really a significant difference, generating all the you know all the abuses that you're uh, uh, talking about. We just haven't elaborated this concept of destitute uh, in, in in a more in a fundamentalish way. Guido, 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 Guido,
department to you know, use reason and balance and what have you. It says, actually, the U.S. Attorney's Manual says that the default rule is that line attorneys, U.S. attorneys, have to bring the highest charges available that the evidence will bear. The whole court, the justices are like, this, uh, this was a, um, this was actually a, um, what's his name, um, uh, Bush 41 Attorney General, uh, Richard. Oh, Thornburg? Thornburg. This is the, the Thornburg rule, which is still there. I don't know how much it's actually used in practice. The justices were just aghast. Yeah, I was which, there. You were there that day? Yeah, I was there. And so the whole, it was exploded. So the whole <laughs> term, they just keep bringing this up. And the like, question why should we just... trust you when your default rule is throw the book at everybody and it finally comes out, Yates ends up five to four, and in dissent, Kagan says, the right answer here is, you know, that, that this is within the statute, and my five, you know, colleagues in the majority are just, um, you know, understandably disgusted at the breadth of prosecutorial discretion. But the way to do that, you know, the court should not try to stop that by reading statutes narrowly. The thing to do is to get Congress not to give them that order of discretion. But the justices are now very, it's just, Brett's right, right, it was just coming up constantly. Yeah, Justice Scalia is the one that he said, what kind of the bad chief, prosecutor would was, bring a case like this? Right. That but, was exactly what they said. Is this the same guy who brought the case in Bond? Right. <laughs> <laughs> because presumably the reason for the Thornburg rule, right, was you charge, you were charged, and then you bargain. Right. And so, so why isn't the which answer worse? what what Kennedy says in Martinez right, against Ryan, right? right? Which is, you know, well, what we need, we've got a system of pleas, and so now we need to. This is sort of like the bureaucracy point, right? That the law, the the, the judicial law, hasn't caught up with the way the thing actually works, right? It, it, the, it's a very uh, interesting it, it, pressure point. Right thinking back to the famous case of the uh, cabin boy that was eaten, uh, Richard Steve. Parker. Uh, <laughs> Dudley Stevens. Dudley Stevens. Uh, the uh, argument was, well, it was murder, it should be prosecuted, and the Crown should immediately uh, issue a pardon, uh, and, or, or a sentence. I remember there was a case in the First Circuit where the old courthouse had a notoriously slow elevator, and the defendant was sentenced. <laughs> Uh, to uh, to spend an hour in the elevator. <laughs> 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 in, in that in that time. So I mean, there are all oh, safety valves. The trouble <laughs> is, uh, having been convicted, there are all sorts of sequelae. Yeah, I I in, in regard to the marijuana thing. I mean, we have presidents who have been in possession of marijuana, probably congressmen. So I don't see how you can say it's okay if you're a sure. U.S. president to smoke, but if you're sick and you need it for medicinal purposes, you can't do it. But I'm wondering why Congress hasn't just changed that, you know, now so that that doesn't become an issue. Um, it would seem to be something that the Congress could get together and do. Well, it's it's a long list they have of those things. <laughs> there is now a, an appropriations rider that that restricts enforcement with respect to legal medical marijuana. It restricts it, not requires it. it. No, it prohibits use of Justice Department funds to, to prevent the implementation of state Ooh. medical Ooh. marijuana law. And interestingly, I mean, and this fits the story, the dynamics of this to some degree, as I understand it, the main impetus was that there were some continued DEA raids in California and the, the delegation pushed this through and it's now been But your question gets a little bit to the gridlock question right. too, because yeah. just as it's hard to enact laws under our system, I mean, it must be very hard. hard to something it's hard to repeal. Is. It's hard to repeal laws, and right. I mean, that's a good sure. argument. I've, I've always been a fan of sunset laws. That's a good way to get rid of laws that um, are archaic. Uh, yeah, and we, we you know, the Independent Council law had that. The Patriot Act was sunsetted, and that had to be re-examined. Uh, laws that are sunset burden shifts instead of being, having to repeal it, you have to reenact it, and that's so arguably that a good a thing. To get but they, they're not that many sunset laws. Right, and, and back when they passed the low drug laws, they probably didn't imagine that it would ever be legal. Um, now, in, yeah. in regard to immigration, though, that is, I mean, more problematic. I guess Obama somewhat does identify with 
immigration thing, but but it seems to me that you think you have to have a law or have to either you should change the law or enforce it. I mean, you can't just have laws that are not enforced. And I'm wondering, assuming it's civil, assuming it's not, you don't have a, a pardon issue if it's not criminal, assuming immigration is civil, and assuming you get rid of this thing where attorney generals can let people have work even though you're not supposed to be here, um, is, is it against the law for a president or for somebody in ICE to not enforce a law? Is it against the law to look the other way when you know there's a violation? Well, that's the question, right? The resources have been the traditional justification. Or to do it the best you can. I mean, right now they have a policy basically of not enforcing it unless the person's a criminal. Well, um, you, impeachment is the... Uh, right. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the right. That's the, the cutting off appropriations for other priorities, slowing down confirmations, and ultimately, you know, extreme case impeachment, those are the remedies. Other questions? There was, you had a question. Yeah, and this is a kind of an uneducated, uh, less informed version of the one having it asked. But there seems to be a big difference between the way I usually think about prosecutorial discretion in the marijuana and immigration cases. You should think about prosecutorial discretion as happening either on a case-by-case -case basis, or as a result of the source allocation But are there other cases where the prosecutorial discretion has been implemented by an ex ante statement that we just simply will not prosecute cases from this class of the offenses? Or is there some, or is it relatively novel to have things like the so there, there's a there's a there's a literature and this is tricky in the immigration context for a legal issue, legal question, but uh, there is literature in administrative law uh, going back maybe 20, 30, maybe more, more than that, uh, in which scholars of administrative law started to look at uh, prosecutions as bureaucracies, as administrative bureaucracies, and advocated the adoption of uh, regularized rules uh, for enforcement priorities. Uh, um, so, uh, and, and if I have this right, um, there are recently, um, I think maybe in New Orleans and San Francisco, uh, the adoption of, uh, of enforcement priority uh, guidelines, I guess is what they're called. Um, so, Right in front of an enforcement official, they might still have right. to prosecute. And in a case where you just simply say we're not going to prosecute any offenses within a large class. So, so in the the immigration context, it is actually it's a part of the defense of the legality of the government's position that this is in the OLC memo that the policy says. Uh, we will not institute removal proceedings against these people su subject to the possibility of case-by-case -case determinations that in some case, in a particular case, removal is appropriate. Uh, so as a technical matter, I'm not sure how many people actually believe that the authorities would in fact behave in that way, but as a technical matter, the policy is not one of complete disclaimer of, uh, of willingness to remove. Uh, it's quite narrow. The, the impression is they will remove only in extraordinary circumstances, but like you know, doing it in front of the uh, enforcement, I mean, that's not gonna be true in the, the ICE case. I can just elaborate in the criminal context Executive 
institutional psychology would find uh, trouble with that. I think. No. Uh, well, with a Duke, with <laughs> prior. Uh, we have a, not, an exhibit <laughs> of judicial <laughs> psychology. Because you're not, you're not <laughs> telling them that they are free to break the law, and you are expressly telling them that it is not a promise of immunity. It depends what, yeah, what it says. Right. Yes. And a promise of immunity would yeah. be problematic. So we're and, two minutes past time. Oh, okay. Should we? So I, I would just, yeah, we can wrap up. I would just note that in the example that Marty just gave, the uh, pardon idea actually can kick in because there is a way of giving these people assurance, which is oh, on January 20, 19th, 2000, pardon, everyone who's pardon everybody who has <laughs> done this stuff. Now the next president gets to decide right. from January 20th on whether you're, okay. Okay, so we'll uh, reconvene in about 15 minutes for a wrap-up session.